I get these press releases all the time and apart from being terrible, they're also all the same. They go on about the highly anticipated new album from some band or other, or should I say from no one in particular, really. And I always think, highly anticipated by who? Who highly anticipates this? And of course the answer is absolutely no one. It's all just words. It's meaningless. But what is not meaningless is to say that, highly anticipated, about a band like Horrendous. Not just because they've built a dedicated fan base and not just because their last albums were great. No. A band like this has a highly anticipated album because people like me highly anticipate what awesome stuff they're going to do musically with the amazing death metal that they play. So if you haven't heard them yet, and they're still a small band, but if you haven't heard them yet, they take the progressive death metal, particularly I think Atheist and Pestilence, they throw in a bit of the way that Cynic sound, not so much on Focus, but more nowadays, that kind of warmer sound that they have. Um, And that's pretty much it. Although, of course, that is to radically undersell what horrendous do. They're brilliant. Um, and the underground has rightfully uh, lapped them up. So, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, come horrendous. I'm talking in this episode to Damien Herring. He's the vocalist and the guitarist. And more importantly, well, that's not true. As importantly, new bassist Alex Kulik, who's only just joined the band for this album, but who has brought so much richness to a genre that really, really uh, allows a bass to shine. I think of Steve Giorgio, uh, you know, any other number of great bassists in death metal. So, uh, this is the Metal Insight Podcast, episode 49. Ah, oh, so close to 50, and I will get there. I will get there. Uh, produced by us at metalireland.com. I'm Earl Grey. Quick note, uh, before we continue, from our sponsors, uh, MCD, who have pretty amazingly given us a pair of tickets to the Metallica gig uh, at Slain next year, June 8th. That's obviously going to be the gig of the year. Uh, Metallica, Ghost, and Bokassa. Um, tickets on sale now at 89.50, but you have a chance to win a pair competition is currently live on the front page of metalireland.com and to shine in Belfast for a chance to win tickets to Mastodon who are hitting the Ulster Hall on the 14th of January with uh, the pretty awesome Cavell Attack, always good fun if you are into oils and Mutoid Man and I gather uh, Scott Kelly from Neurosis is going to be there as well, I don't know in what capacity but it's always worth a watch. Tickets on sale now uh, again go to the front page of the site for that competition in the next day or two I'll get that live. So, back to Horrendous. Thanks for bearing with that. Um, Horrendous are probably the least horrendous people you could come across. They are so polite, so gentlemanly, so cool, as you'll hear. And I began by putting it to Alex and Damien that the new one, the new album, Idol, sounds a lot warmer, a lot rounder, a lot more vibrant uh, than the albums before. I am, yeah. Well, well, I guess firstly the production, but secondly, I think the the approach as well. Yeah, yeah. I guess that makes sense. Um, I mean, Alex can comment more on the bass uh, itself, but I feel like there's uh, a good bit more going on with the bass on this record. Um, and in that sense, that provides like a nice low end warmth uh, to the whole thing. Mm, Alex? Yeah, definitely. I uh, I definitely. I appreciate this Kieran, right? Is that your name? It is. That's my name. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah, I, I definitely, I see what you're talking about. I, I, I think Damien's onto something with the bass and some of the tonal things going on there. I also think that a lot of the time, I, Damien is a man uh, who I think has, uh, just as the band has, has made a lot of leaps and bounds production-wise and just constantly learning. And since, uh, you know, I heard him say in another interview we did about like clarity being really important to him. And I think that, you know, a lot of the time when you hear clarity in every instrument, it does feel a little bit rounder because you can actually, you know, everything's kind of settling into your ears as opposed to like one thing being blaringly out front and another thing being in the back and that like actually orally has like a jaggedness to it and mm. everyone's really present. The bass is really clean and the, you know, the tone stuff is like rolled off a little, my tone knobs rolled off a little bit and there's some finger playing in there. So it's like certain things the clarity mixed with you know the really present bass i think does give it um you know some some rounded qualities and some warm qualities for sure absolutely it's a joy i mean it's a musician's joy but it's also a very um 
I, I, do you know what strikes me about it is i mean you, you guys obviously and we'll talk about this i'm sure you get you know you get comparisons to atheist and, and cynic and stuff uh, all the time but the one thing that i think about this is when i think of um you know the death metal bands who's whose path in which you follow um it seems to me that cynic always had a very sort of um open and uh, almost gentle tonality about their music obviously it was death metal but it was a very sort of gentle and soft death metal if those things aren't mutually exclusive um i think idol actually has that same sort of um light touch or sort of soft touch and and i don't mean that as a criticism um do you know what i'm getting at like if, if, you, if you listen to kind of the later cynic albums or even focus you hear a, a real gentleness um and it seems to me that idol actually has a bit of that i i'm happy to hear that i don't know how damien i don't know how you feel about that but i i certainly don't take it as a as a, a i mean if someone means it critically that's fine too but yeah i mean you know there is like there is like a i think this comes down maybe to like a lot of the melodic qualities and different types of heavy music that we all like, all four of us. And like, yeah, that gentleness is like something, there's something in heavy music that I thought at the end of the day, like was connected to that. And so, you know, just a different, bunch of different ways I could spin that. But yeah, I, I think that's totally there. And I'm happy to hear you say that. I don't know about you, David. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say um, to me, uh, I feel like the word is more of like, um, an expressiveness as opposed to gentleness. I think you're right. I think gentleness is the wrong word, isn't it? But I, I think you know the sentiment. I think you know what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, and, and in that sense, um, I definitely agree. And I, I think that's a great compliment. A lot of people think of death metal as just this aggressive form of music. But if you can you know, inject some emotion and some expressive playing into that aggression and, and filter it through death metal. I think that's a, a really cool trait. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, I mean, I'm a, I'm a massive fan of um, the chills, perhaps more so than some of, uh, you know, the albums that followed. But I, I just loved the aggression that, you know, the chills really was an aggressive record. And it reminded me just so very, very much of um, of Pestilence, um, you know, from around the kind of Testimony of the Ancients era. And um, I, I guess, I don't know, was it modelled on that in any way? Because it's, it's just so brimming with, with the influence. <laughs> um, well, I mean, yeah, I, I would say uh, probably more consuming impulse, at least for me, yeah. uh, was a, a relatively big influence. And I feel like Martin Van Drunnen uh, in that era is pretty much the best death metal vocalist of all time. So <laughs> I guess I, I may have uh, taken some inspiration from him. Just a touch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's... I had actually sort of missed a little bit of that thanks to a work complication. Sorry about that. Um, but oh, no. who, who was it that you were referring to, Damien? Uh, I was talking about Martin Van Drunen. Uh, oh, yeah. The <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, er, early early pestilence, I mean, it's, it's great stuff. And, I, yeah, I'd say, um, particularly on the chills, uh, that, that was more of a, a thing. Yeah, I, I think it's um, obviously that's an influence that carries through because I, I was listening to, um, you know, Devotion, Blood for Ink, um, the solo on that is absolutely pure pestilence and, and even I mean it reminds me of spheres uh, just just the timing of the way the notes are struck um, I think that influence really still shines through that's cool yeah yeah that's mm -hmm. really awesome Good. well listen tell me this um, something that I find surprising and maybe this might interest some of of my listeners um, you know everybody streams nowadays uh, to release their record and stuff and people go to like Invisible Oranges or or um, Oh, who knows? There are so many places, but you guys chose to go with Kerrang uh, for the first stream um, of Idol, which I guess a lot of people might think is a strange choice, uh, given you know how distant Kerrang seems to be these days from you know what we would consider sort of underground metal, um, and particularly with your style of metal that probably most appeals to I don't know guys presently getting into their forties, you know, because it's this kind of early nineties. You know, sort of uh, proggy death metal. Well, why did you choose Kerrang? Because the audience seems to be, you know, quite quite different from from those who might typically buy your album. <laughs> uh, yeah, go go ahead, Alex. Do you have any thoughts on that? 
Well, I will say this much, um, and I, I don't know uh, uh, exactly how to put this. So when it comes to streaming, so we work pretty closely with the label. We have a friend of ours who's really, really close to us um, who essentially handles a lot of the PR stuff. Mm-hmm. It seems to me, from what I was able to pick up, is that there were a bunch of options fielded, and what we ended up having to choose between Kerrang! was what we just ended up preferring. Mm-hmm. If I had, if any of us had our own like actual individual choices, I think we probably would have gone with something a little bit different. Yeah. Um, although I was happy with the write-up and, and what they had to say about it, and it was a beautiful page in general. But yeah, it was really more a matter of, of circumstance than it was a, cur- a curative you know, it I wasn't see. a choice of curating, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, mean, I mean, these these things are, they're normally handled by, like, basically the PR department yeah. of whatever label we're working with. Um, I personally thought it was cool just because it was something different. Yeah. Um, and they do have a, a, a pretty large audience, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, from, from what I've heard. Yeah. So I feel like that was a nice change for us. Yeah. I, it's funny because... Um, I, I hesitate to use the word kids because it's kind of you know pejorative and I, I don't mean it like that but um you know in a way there's nothing new under the sun and every cycle comes back around you know we had the thrash revival a while back and you know kids coming up now want to you know maybe hark back uh to to, to different ways I, you know the, the way you guys are with the whole um you know just you just look like normal sort of underground death metal band that's fine but it does still have that sort of early 90s feel with a big uh nike air jordans and things like that you know sort of thrashy shoes and stuff but you know maybe yeah. maybe, maybe it's good i don't know kind of what age ranges uh, of people you're finding getting into your stuff even though it's very much a, an early 90s um you know fascination but do you find that the younger kids do come through you know interested in such technical metal it's interesting you know it's always you're not the first person to you know to obviously to bring up the the early 90s thing but to me, I feel like a lot of the people who are really, really diehard fans of the early 90s stuff are actually people who are sometimes the most critical mm. of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's more, I feel like, from my personal experience, some of the people that I've actually made friends with just reaching out about liking the music and from us touring and stuff have been like people who are younger than me. I'm 25. Mm. Um, and people who are younger than me who I think have an ear for like, you know, young kids have the internet and they've been able to learn about a wide array of things really quickly. So mm-hmm. that's like, you know, you can find those records from the late 80s, early 90s and listen through all that stuff. You can also hear all the new bands. And I feel like um, from we've had, I feel like the age range is really crazy for us in a way that is, makes me really happy. Where some people who are a lot older than me and then some kids who I think have an ear for things that are looking to carve a, just a slightly different path using familiar mechanisms. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I, I have heard a number of young kids who really really love the music and i've heard a bunch of older people who really love the music i don't know damien what your experience is you, you keep your eye on the on the the prize with hearing what people have to say so <laughs> um yeah i mean i i agree um i think what you said like about how uh kids have the internet these days and and plus the whole like there's basically there's been like a revival of, of the whole old school death metal thing so i feel like fans of that genre really run the gamut, you know, from, from really young, like even teenagers to, uh, you know, dudes in their forties. Yeah. And yeah, I, I always thought it was really cool that like we would have guys at our shows who are like in their forties and, you know, they're actually like huge fans of, of bands like Iron Maiden or Judas Priest and, and yet they're, they're at our show and they think it's awesome. So yeah. I, I think that's really cool. Well, look, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that attracts people to your music, I, mean, I guess you're part of a, a clutch of bands now. I mean, I'm thinking of bands like um, Beyond Creation and, and people like that really, really pushing, you know, the, the technical sort of end of things uh, recently. Um, so let, let, let's talk about the music then. I mean, you you know, we have to start talking about the bass because, you know, and not to hark backwards again, but this is unfortunate, but it's total like Tony Choi uh, worship, isn't it? It's great uh, finger playing, good, good... I'm just thinking of um, Soothsayer in particular, and I'm thinking of that pulsing that you do, that dat, 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 you know, when it, when it yeah. speeds up. I love that so much, you know, and it just adds such energy and, and vitality to the to the rest of the music. Yeah, um, that's, I appreciate the kind words. It means a lot. Um, it's always really interesting. It, it, makes me, it makes me think back. I don't know who it was who said this, but there's someone in literature who talks about, or someone in art who talks about... Um, 
you know, you study up, you study up on what's been done uh, and, and who's done what so that you can, you can kind of see uh, how to not repeat um, by accident, you yeah. know, where yeah. like you're just doing, going about doing things and playing and that you, you realize that, you, you know, you're really following in the footsteps um, almost subconsciously. The great thing about, the weird thing about me is that like, you know, a lot of the compare Tony, it's really funny, and I love this, like the Tony Choi thing, right? I was, I loved Atheist growing up, um, especially when I when I heard that band for the first time. Maybe it was in eighth grade, eighth grade or ninth grade, and that stuff like really blew my my head off. Um, but I, you know, I don't think about Tony Choi all that much, and actually, like I, I can't really recall any singular bass line. I can kind of re- recall the sound, yeah. and you know that that it's bass forward, and then he was a finger player. Interestingly enough, I play with a pick most of the time, but there are certain sections on the record that I play with my fingers, and so oh, I really? actually stop between the two. Yeah, um, yeah I, I actually, um, some of the parts are just way too much for me to play with my fingers, and of then course. there are certain things that I like doing with a pick that I just don't want to sacrifice, and then certain times where I really want to get, because I play a fretted bass, but we often try to get a fretless-ish sound yes. out of it, yes. obviously playing playing with your fingers um, helps with that, and, and of course, Damien and Matt's bass work on the last few records... Um, definitely reflected that kind of fretless push um, on fretted bases as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I come from like I come from the Jaco Pastoria school, man. Like, oh, beautiful, I'm a, I'm a, beautiful. I'm a jazzer. Like, I mean, like I not in the the traditional way. I, I don't play a lot of like standards or anything. But you know, I was a big fusion fan in high school, and that music really opened me up to a lot of different possibilities. And I always loved, you know, Jaco made bass from. Uh, said you know we're a rhythm section instrument but we can also be a solo instrument as well Mm -hmm. and you know expand the possibilities of this instrument and i try i think that there's a dearth of or not i don't know if that's right where there's uh there's not always the bass isn't always as present as i'd like in metal music even you know and i I can often hear that bass players are doing really crazy stuff um so i like to try to bring it out forward a little bit a little bit brighter sound and of course damien has always had his ear on that i mean like i said a focus on clarity from from Damien's perspective, and yeah. I think his production on this record, and I, I want him to kind of say something about this too, it helps with that a lot. You know, it's not just my playing, it's where it sits in the mix, and like, you know, the, the breath that it was given, like in the production, which I think when we play live comes out too. Mm. So, Damien, give us a word on that. I mean, a very uh, generous um, production decision um, to give Alex such space, even though he's the new entrant into the band. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I've always... I don't know. I, I've always felt like in metal, um, or at least the metal, most of the metal I was listening to, bass sort of always took a back seat, uh, particularly to the guitars. And... I guess it was mostly because the bass was sort of just following what the guitars were doing anyway, so you don't really need to hear it. Um, but I mean, with, with Horrendous, even from the beginning, uh, you know, Matt and I, we weren't bass players, so but we knew we needed bass on the record, so basically what we would do is we would treat it as if it were a third guitar. So what ended up happening was, you know, we would be writing all these fancy, like, basically leads it was basically a bass solo the whole time <laughs> and uh <laughs> so from that standpoint you know when i'm when i'm doing the mixing uh, uh you know we spent all this time on the bass i definitely want it to be heard mm. so it's it, it's really the, the case with all the instruments you know i i want i don't want anybody to have to like struggle to hear what they want to hear you know they can hone in on what they want but at the same time everything sounds cohesive and it, it sounds, nothing's, you know, too in the forefront, nothing's too in the background, everything sounds gelled together, um, but also clear. Yeah. You guys um, are a case study in the importance of artwork. And I know everybody, I mean, I've seen you recent uh, Ask Me Anything on Reddit and stuff, and I know a lot of people gravitate toward the, the question of the artwork for, for good reason, because it's absolutely incredible. But, you know, from Ecdesis, um, if that's the right pronunciation, is that how you say it? Yeah, Ectasis. Ectasis onward. I mean, you've obviously had Brian Smith's uh, just absolutely mind-bogglingly brilliant artwork. But 
do you think people would have paid as much attention to you? Um, you know, I, you know, you didn't plaster your spiky logo over the front of Act This Is Onward. Um, it, it's just like, look at the art. This is it. Um, again, another brave decision not to even sort of put your logo on it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's funny. I feel like we've been extremely fortunate, um, not only to have found Brian, but uh, for him to actually agree to work with us and to agree to continue working with us. Uh, it's almost like we have this in-house artist, <laughs> yeah. which is pretty, pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, when we saw the, the Ectasis art for the first time, I mean, we were just blown away and... Uh, you know, you don't want to taint that with, you know, a silly death metal logo. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I actually, you make an interesting point. Um, I definitely feel like the visual aspect of an album and ours in particular, um, has at least helped attract, uh, some people to take a listen that might not have otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. And I mean, I, I wonder, and I, I don't want to break any confidences, but you know, you're on a new label now and stuff like that. Um, who may have a, a kind of sharper elbows in the business, as it were, just because they're bigger. Did, did they try to get you to, to put the logo on, on the front of the new artwork, or were they totally happy just to leave, um, you know, obviously the art to do the talking? Not a word was said. Really? Uh, yeah. And that, as far as I know, Damien, I don't know if you know any different, but they were, they pretty much let us lead the, I mean, they, you know, they I think the guy who did the layout is someone who did before, so we worked with him before. Uh, Damien, you're probably better at answering this, but as far as I know, we were left to make the decision. Mm. Yeah, there, there was nothing from the label on that. Um, the guy who did the layout, he was actually, he hadn't worked with us before, okay. um, but uh, he, I believe he has worked on other Season of Mist releases. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, Season has been great. Like, they... they you know, haven't had any sort of influence in terms of like, oh, we want it to sound like this or yeah. we want it to look like that. You know, they've yeah. we've they've allowed us to be uh, what we've always been. You know, yeah. in co- basically in complete control of, of the process. Yeah, no, they know exactly what they're doing. Um, so I I suppose then uh, you know back to the music. One of the things that strikes me is, um, y- you're quite traditionalist in a way because you know so many death metal bands. You know, there's a lot of down tuning and a lot of like you know repetitive and, and um you know bl- blast beats for the sake of it a lot of you know unnecessary clickety clackety double bass you're the complete opposite you're quite a traditional metal band uh it sounds to me like you're playing an e maybe not i don't know but um yeah you know you don't you don't feel the need you know you go back to those death records the lowest they ever down tuned was like e flat or d on occasion you know um yeah. what, what kind of range are you in and, and why are you there you know why not using it you know a seven string at this point or why not tune down a bit further to gain that bit more, you know, heaviness, aggression? Um, yeah, well, it's, it's funny. I mean, I feel like we, you're, you're correct that we play in standard um, and, and drop D, um, but, you know, that's just one string <laughs> tuned yeah. down to step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's funny. I feel like we started playing that way, uh, you know, sort of out of laziness because we didn't want to down tune and have to like reset up our guitars. Um, but also, I mean, you know, Matt and Jamie, they grew up playing like punk and thrash and, and they, they never like down tuned or anything. Um, so, I mean, we had that background too. And, you know, we're just playing death metal riffs in, in standard E. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's interesting. Uh, I guess Alex's bass is, is set up a little bit differently. So maybe he can touch on that. Yeah, totally. I have to echo Damien in terms of, you know, I grew up as a, a young thrash kid during the the thrash revival. There was a little local thrash scene um, in my town, so that, that definitely has an influence where, you know, we're playing just like there was something too standard tuning that really gave it, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of sound at a certain moment. But I, I have a couple of thoughts um, to talk about the bass, as Damien was referring to. I actually play, I only play a four string, but I have, um, it's a Dunnable. Uh, I, I had a custom made this way thanks to Sasha Dunnable um, from Intronaut. He essentially made me a four string with a low B on the bottom. So mm-hmm. instead of E-A-D-G, I have B-E-A-D on the bottom. So 
Um, there are certain parts now where, like, any time a B shows up, like a power chord B in the old Horrendous songs, I'll, I'll use the lower string for some extra yeah. scary in there and things like that. And I can play, you know, while we're ch- changing between playing uh, songs that are in standard and E and then drop tune to drop D, I can I can play, I essentially just play all the same because I have a, a, a D available on the low string on my bass, mm-hmm. which is really nice. Um but I, I have a couple of thoughts about this. You know, something I, I've always thought is that heaviness, like, to me, has never had any correlation to how low a guitar is tuned. Although there, there are some that I could say undeniably has led, has lent it this, you know, crazy amount of heaviness. But you know, it's it's interesting to try to just see how, you know, what you can do with what you have. I, I'm also an improvised music person, and so I know a lot of musicians who use alternate tunings and put clips on their strings and it's like prepared guitar kind of stuff which mm-hmm. is awesome i love that stuff but every time i go to d- tune my guitar to something else i'm like i'm still mesmerized by standard tuning like i'm still doing things that i like have no idea about it's just yeah. like constant playground i know what you I, mean about the, the the no correlation thing because something that always blows my head off is that um the deicide albums and like uh, you know like deicide and once upon the cross are actually an e flat and they're they just yeah, yeah. blow everything away that's in like uh, you know B or something. Uh, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I'm totally right there with you. So mm. there's definitely I think you know, the laziness. I mean, it is nice to just like not have to tune a whole bunch, which is awesome. Um, or like get special strings or have a special guitar. But also I think maybe I don't know, if, Damien, if you agree. But I'm also like how you know I, how I don't I don't feel limited by my tuning yet. Yeah. Right. No, I agree. I mean, that is sort of like a half joke saying it was out of laziness. Um, but yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, I feel like that's another cool thing. Like nobody, nobody these days is really playing in standard or drop T. They're all yeah. down tuning. And even from a production side of things, I feel like playing in standard uh, actually helps in terms of clarity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because you don't have everything competing, you know, in the complete bottom registers. Yeah compressed to fuck as well you know yeah um yeah. One, one of the things uh, that that leads on because you know the other aspect is you know the saturation of of blast beats these days and uh, you know I, I could take a comparable band to where you guys are at the minute i know i talked about beyond creation earlier but you know they're of course all, all um uh you know everything but the kitchen sink and uh, blasts everywhere I, you guys you've sort of held back from it maybe you know a devotion i think has a bit of speed in it and there might be a little bit of speed i think it suits there as well but um you know you clearly you have the chops to do it again it's a choice it's like listening to you know th- there wasn't a single blast beat across the entire death discography for example and you know no one ever said where are the blast beats you know it's, so you know you guys could clearly do it if you wanted to so it must be a choice that you haven't um yeah i mean I don't know i mean blast beats are cool and you know we'll throw them in every now and then but uh for the most part uh, i think jamie is is trying to do more interesting beats and even throw in things that you typically don't hear in metal mm. um and i think that 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 creates a, a more interesting listening experience yeah i agree entirely i also think that there's you know all four of us have an affinity for blast beats that we all you know we all grew up and all have these these special places in our hearts for different different corners of heavy music. I think personally, I, I, again, every individual in this group makes decisions for themselves. Mm-hmm. So you know, I can't speak for everyone per se. Damien's definitely right on the money. You know, Jamie and Matt and, and everyone, and to some extent, are, are uh, you know are fans of different kinds of music and a lot of prog coming from Jamie and Matt. Mm-hmm. But something I think about too is that like blast beats are this like crazy invention right this crazy drum invention that like is one of the things that although you see it in a couple moments you might see hear tony williams do a blast beat s thing in like the 70s or something it's something that metal brought to the table and you want it to hit people you know so if you're using blast beats all the time uh you know uh, particularly in death metal i think uh it i you know it loses its edge so when i feel like when that really crazy blast beat part comes in in devotion you know with Damien doing those little vocal pickups beforehand, it smashes you in the face. You yeah, know, like it's yeah. a, it's like being dropped from the top of a roller coaster. And I think if we had been using blast beats for the whole record, that wouldn't be the case. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you have inspired uh, quite some loyalty uh, to your music. You know, the people that have picked you up have really, really sort of um, 
evangelized for you and about you and um, i can see that happening already with you and even on the the forums of 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 the website you know that i that i run um you can see a, a quite a devoted sort of um coterie of people getting quite excited about the album um i'm just wondering you know you must see yourselves as like inheritors of the whole sort of watchtower cynic atheist death pestilence you know you must see yourselves somehow as, as keeping that flame burning because otherwise it would it would get extinguished actually you know one thinks quite quite quickly you know as time just moves on hey well i just to be briefer about it um I have a hard time, and I think uh, all of us do in certain ways. I certainly don't. I don't think about it in that way because I don't think that I could ever touch, you know, the achievements of those people or or try to. You know, mm. uh, it's the influences shine through. You can, you don't really have a choice. You know, like the things that have influenced you. Like it's Damien, Jamie, and Matt, and I didn't know we, I didn't know them back when I heard Cynic for the first time, but mm. it's been stuck in my blood so so much so that I I, I can't avoid it. You know, mm. it's just there. Um, it's a big responsibility to carry a torch, so I don't know if I can say that I really feel that I, I don't look in the mirror or think of myself and think of that way. I, ha- I have to admit it. Um, but if that's what people feel, and if, if personally you care, if you're saying that you feel like it's not being carried forward by too many people and that we're doing that, I think that that's really amazing. I hope that I something I play could affect someone, someone young like Cynic and Atheist and Watchtower and all that stuff did for me. You know, C- Cynic did try that actually. There was this one terrible Cynic album. I can't remember. It wasn't called Cynic. It was called something else. And uh, Paul Masvidal, he got um, I can't remember the name of the singer. Well, I do. Her name was Aruna Adams, I think. Um, and they had these terrible tracks. I think one was called Mirror Child and things. I don't know. Did you ever see the Portal? That was the name of it. Portal. Good. It it, it it was desperately bad. It was so bad that you should actually go looking for it because. Yeah, Aruna Adams, I think, and I think the, I think the band was called Portal. The, the release was called the Portal Tapes. Oh, Portal, the Portal Tapes. Yeah, it's terrible. Never do that. <laughs> it was really bad. I, <laughs> oh God, I yeah, I think I, it, was, it was a demo tape, right? Something like that. Yeah, and there it um, should have stayed. Um, yeah, I think. God, it was really shit on too. But the um, one of, one of the things you see that strikes me about you guys is um you know i suppose a lot of death metal comes from anger but i'm not hearing a lot of anger. you know you guys are just kind of cool dudes you know and just play music for the love of music and it, it, i i do wonder albeit that you have that kind of martin van drunen vocal going on and stuff like that but it doesn't sound to me like you're angry about much stuff i mean what what is the wellspring of uh, you know of the vocal uh, or the lyrical slant because you just seem kind of really happy and nice <laughs> <You know? laughs> um don't be full there's an anger there <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's, <laughs> I guess people are sometimes surprised uh, by our demeanor, but I mean, the truth is we are just, you know, pretty normal guys who, uh, you know, happen to like metal yeah. and are in a death metal band. Um, but I mean, yeah, the, the, I mean, the lyrics, you know, they've varied over the years, but on Idol in particular, uh, Matt handled uh, a lot of those and uh, he was having like a, a rough time of his, his job as a teacher um, and I think that that inspired, along with the sort of political situation, uh, not just in the U.S., but but uh, in the world, you know, overall, I feel like that inspired uh, 
a lot of the sort of like an inner turmoil uh, that we explore on the record. Yeah. So, yeah. I oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Damien. No, no I've, that's that's good. <laughs> you always you always like so good at wrapping it up in like a nugget that's hard to like add to. Uh, <laughs> but I think he's right on the money. You know, I the anger is an interesting question. Uh, I, I will say just in general. Idol came from a point where I think for everyone there was just massive change, a lot of questioning. You know, that making the record in itself was a was a was a huge huge challenge and like so, like you know an uphill climb on an emotional level and took like a lot so much effort. I always like joke that that, that the record almost like nearly killed every one of us in our own respective corners. Uh, and uh, so I. But I do think that something that comes to, and I, I can actually say this as, an, as the nice thing is I can say this as an outside observer, someone who's listened to three records where, that I had nothing to do with. Yeah. Um, there's something, someone said something that, were, there was like, that there was this light that comes through the music, like even though it's like death metal and it's heavy and it's aggressive and, you know, it's growling and all that is light that comes through, which, yeah, it comes from those like heavy metal loves that we all have you know where we like these traditional metal things but also there's this thing where i think everyone in the group has like this personality and has this way of looking at the world where it's kind of like this this climb like this kind of like victorious temperament towards like just pushing on a little bit further and you know there's like an optimism there that i think it exists in everyone and that i think that people you know you're, that kind of thing you're just saying about everyone seeming like nice guys like it comes from that i think everyone's like really searching and really thinking about their place in the world and, and just trying to do the best things that we can possibly do and like, you know, where to go next. We're not sure of ourselves, you know, uh, we're constantly questioning things. Uh, the political situation is obviously a huge thing and I think shows up in the record in a lot of different ways. Um, but all of us. Yeah. Well, hang on, hang on. I have, I, I have to, I have to ask, I mean, that, where does the political sh situation show up? I mean, how is that reflected? Is it anger or is it is it frustration? I mean, how 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 could a listener to Idol uh, hear any kind of um, you know um, example or or how would they get the feels for for anger at the political situation? If, they, if you know to the listener, where 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 would we do it? What track? I mean, where where can we where can we distinguish this? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's in a lot of different places. The thing is, is that I think that fun thing about making art is that you can be intentional about something while also hoping that it stays open to other things. So mm -hmm. I don't want to close the doors on an interpretive level for anyone. Yeah. Uh, but if you were really looking for it, if you look at the lyrics for a lot of different songs, mm. um, obviously the thematic of the album is that we sort of discovered along the way. It wasn't like a... Thing. We're like, we're going to make an album about this and then do it. We, it, just, it kind of revealed itself to us over time where it's about the multiple diff the, the different kinds of idols in our lives. And that's personal things that we worship internally that keep us from exploring new things. That's external pressures like political regimes or jobs or expectations. All those things are all over. I mean, I, I can think of certain lyrical lines mm -hmm. uh, personally, ones that, that, that have really stuck out to me, mm. you know, there's a line that Matt sings, I can't remember on which song, I think it's Idolater, where he says, uh, so who can we trust um, on this nightmare witch hunt, uh, this haunted millennium, mm. uh, and there are things like that, there mm -hmm, are things mm -hmm. talking about, uh, you know, deception, and Obelis is kind of about this person going through this Sisyphean challenge of, you know... Is it hubris for more? To, uh, is it hubris to ask for more when the thief is at its end? You know, there's like all these. There's lots of different ways to look at it, but each I think each song comes at it from a different angle. I don't know. Mm -hmm. if it, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to state exactly, but sure. it's in the lyrics. Really nice guys there, Alex and Damien from Horrendous. So that is all for this episode of the podcast. We will be back soon with number fifty. Anyone you think uh, we should interview? I don't know, man. Just email me and I will do it. I guess as long as they're very, very good and very interesting. So yeah, mi at metalireland.com. If you've got any suggestions for the big 5-0, uh, who should be on the podcast, maybe it should be an entirely Irish episode. How would that go? Maybe we could do that. Um, or maybe it could be, I don't know, something else entirely. Mail me, mi at metalireland.com. <laughs> Mail me, mi at metalireland.com. And I'll, I'll think about uh, what we can do to make that one just a little bit special. So from me, Earl Grey, and all at Metal Ireland, it is over and out.